Hallelujah. Thank you. The Lord is good, and he is greatly to be praised. I thank my pastor for allowing us to have a missional focused weekend, um, which is the cornerstone of our church. And I thank him for allowing us to practice preaching behind his pulpit. Amen. <laughs> It is a wonderful honor to be here, and I thank this choir who has blessed me richly this morning. <laughs> and bless the Lord for Reverend Richard Lee. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, sir. There is a message from the Lord. Um, if you could stand on your feet and turn with me to Genesis 21. Genesis 21, Genesis is the first book. <laughs> and we're going to start around verse 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham scoffing. Therefore she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be an heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman, because he is your seed. So Abraham rose there early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water, and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water in the skin was used up, and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what ails you, Hagar? Fear not. For God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We love you, we adore you, and we thank you, Lord God, for being in this place. We pray, Lord God, that you, your word will go forth, and we know that it will not return void. So we also pray, Lord God, that you would hide your servant behind you, that she will just peer out every now and again, but they will mostly see you and not her. We pray, Lord God, a special anointing over her as she proclaims what Thus saith you. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. For a topic of discussion, this message is called The Message. As I prayed while planning the Missional Sunday series, the Lord gave me direction that each of the four fifth Sundays should be themed. Each should reflect and inform the worshiper of the ways in which the Alpha Street Baptist Church carries out our mission to build disciples to win the world for Christ. His message to me was to use Isaiah 61 as a foundational scripture. You know this scripture, but you may not know that you know it. It is the same passage that Jesus reads in the temple to the people and the cornerstone of his ministry. You've heard it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. That's it. The, that's the message. That is what we as Christians, followers of Christ, should be doing. 
It's a wonderful passage, and the entire chapter is glorious. It speaks of the poor, the broken, those in captivity, the downtrodden, and how God loves justice and what is right. Read it in its entirety when you get home. This weekend, the first missional Sunday of 2017, the theme is justice for the poor. God has blessed and continues to bless this church tremendously, and I believe that it is because we continue to give so much. Justice doesn't mean just us. We are mandated to take care of those who are less fortunate, and that means persons with no money, yes, but also persons who are poor in spirit. So I thought about it and I asked, what is justice for the poor? I asked my colleagues and some of them said that they didn't know. Others said that there is no justice for the poor, only injustice. Then I asked the Lord, what is justice for the poor? His answer to me, freedom. It is the physical freedom of those who are literally bound, but it is also the unshackling of minds. It is the freedom to be, to exist, to dream, and to do. It is access beyond what is thought to be attainable. It is breathing without someone telling you to hold your breath. It is salvation. It is being seen, being heard, and being held. Freedom, liberation. Gustavo Gutierrez, a Peruvian monk of the Dominican order who is said to be one of the fathers of liberation theology, believes there are three tenets to this line of thinking. First, it involves political and social liberation, the elimination of the immediate causes of poverty and injustice. Second, liberation involves the emancipation of the poor, the marginalized, the downtrodden, and the oppressed from all those things that limit their capacity to develop themselves freely and in dignity. And lastly, liberation theology involves liberation from selfishness and sin, a reestablishment of a relationship with God and with other people. He says, if there's no friendship with them, meaning the poor, and no sharing of the life of the poor, then there is no authentic commitment to liberation because love exists only among equals. In an interview, Gutierrez said, the poor person is someone who is treated as a non-person, someone who is considered insignificant from an economic, political, and cultural point of view. The poor count as statistics. They are nameless. But even though the poor remain insignificant within society, they are never insignificant with God. How do you get justice for the poor? You help set the captives free. Well, I hear you asking, well, how do we do that? This brings me to the text today. The story of Abraham and Sarah is a complicated one. It informs us that God's promises come to pass no matter how long it takes. And it teaches us about keeping the faith for God's word does not return void. It is the story that births the nation Israel as Abraham at 75 and Sarah at 65 years old were promised a son that will ensure Abraham's posterity. It, is also, it also reveals a not so good side. We tend to gloss over what happens in this story. We romanticize it because we see the big picture, the end result, and the problem is we only read it from one perspective, which is Abraham and Sarah's perspective. We don't read it in another voice. Yes, Abraham is still considered the father of faith. And Sarah, who was once barren, brought forth the child Isaac, which God promised. But there was another child before Isaac. We kind of joke and make light of the situation saying Abraham and Sarah got tired of waiting for God so they decided to help him out. But there was another child born to an Egyptian slave whose perspective for some reason we do not identify with. Her name is Hagar. She is first mentioned in chapter 16 and not again until 21. 
We gloss over the fact that Sarah owned Hagar. And what does ownership really mean? It means you don't have an identity. You don't have control and say so over your body. You can't leave when you want. You can't get a break unless someone says you can. Your identity is tied to someone else. You are not human, you are property. Sarah being her owner gives Hagar to Abraham for the purpose of being a breeder. Because she owns Hagar, any children she may have belong to Sarah. And it elevates her status because being barren is considered being broken and lowers her status in society. And having a baby in any way builds her back up. Can I make it plain here? Hagar was a black woman trafficked for the product of a child. She was mistreated, abused, used, raped, forced to be a surrogate, a breeder, and even though Sarah gives her to Abraham as a second wife, Hagar did not have any say in the matter. Her body was not her own. There was no consent because both of them had the power over her. Hagar has the baby, and her son grew. And at the time we read chapter 21, he is approximately 16 years old, and Sarah also had the son that God promised. The text says, Sarah sees Hagar's son scoffing, but a better meaning in Hebrew is playing. And he was probably playing with his little brother. And she says to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely Isaac. She does not claim the firstborn whom she had a hand in creating the situation and circumstance by which he was born. No accountability whatsoever. Sarah wants to make sure Hagar knows her place. She also wants to remind Abraham of Hagar's status. She doesn't even call her by name. She uses the term ama or bondwoman. A better name for it is female slave or concubine cast out this slave and her son because they cannot share in the same rights and privileges as my son. Deport her as she is the threat to me and my son's life and livelihood. I shouldn't have to share and my son will not share with this. His pedigree says, what his pedigree says is rightfully his. Sarah reminds Abraham of who Hagar is, a slave. I own her, and therefore she can't have what I have, and she does not have any rights unless I say so. I control whether she goes and comes, stays or leaves, and she's got to go. Kick this chick, this nasty woman, and her son out of my house. Her son's name is not acknowledged in this passage. It is not spoken. Know your place. I will not say your name. If I don't say it, I can't see it. If I can't see it, I can't address it because it doesn't exist in my eyes. You don't have an identity, a birthright, or inheritance. If you are not named, you don't exist. You are deemed unimportant. It's in the name who and how we refer to others. We have to acknowledge that the poor are people who have names. They are human and they exist. Sarah, Isaac, and Abraham get named in this passage. The son of the slave does not. Abraham becomes concerned. He is disheartened because of his son, who is Hagar's son, which may lead us to believe that maybe if the son was able to stay, all would be well with him. The mother doesn't matter. He recognizes his seed, his firstborn, who was his only child for all of 14 years and is now approximately 16, the one he had been steeping in their traditions the one whom he thought he would find a wife for and would bring him generations. Then God spoke to Abe and reminded him that Isaac is to carry the promised generations. He says, 
listen to your wife and be not dismayed concerning the other boy and the slave for he will also be a nation. Harsh words for a just God. But sometimes God has to speak to us in terms we can understand. And Abraham understood however harsh it may sound. The promise extended to the son of the slave because he is biologically connected to Abraham. So Abraham does what God and Sarah says. And the text says that he rose early in the morning because he may not have wanted to cause attention to the scene of expulsion due to the party he was hosting to celebrate the weaning of Isaac. He got up, took some bread and skin full of water, gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent them away. Cast out, placement, your place is not with me. You were always the other, the outsider. Now you will literally be outdoors out of these borders and out from my protection, provision, and out from under my power. Can we park here for a minute? Because sometimes you have to read the text as if you were witnessing this action for the first time, for, for the right time at the time it was happening. Imagine the scene of this 16-year-old trying to wrap his mind around his father sending him away. It could not have been peaceful. I imagine they were tears and wailing, pulling at him, begging to stay. Brokenness, broken spirits, broken hearts. He didn't know if he would see his father again. Abraham didn't know if he would see his son again. And his mom did not know what she was going to do. Grief, worry, fear, anxiety, etc. She is now evicted with her teenage son, a single black mom homeless with no health care, not knowing where their next meal would come from after the little bit of groceries are gone and not eligible for food stamps because she is not a citizen or qualified alien. There is no pension plan as a slave can't save anything if I was never paid. Not really safe in the wilderness being a woman, so my son is compelled to protect me. He's going through puberty and grief, wondering why this happened, and both may have been wondering, is it me? Did I cause this? What did I do to deserve this? The boy is crying, I'm tired, we've been walking forever, the water is gone, feeling dehydrated. He cries to me saying, I'm hungry. He's crying out to me and I can't do anything to help him because I can't help myself. Every time I look at him reminds me of what I was in and now free of. He reminds me of my bondage. He reminds me that I was trafficked and he looks just like his father, I mean my rapist. But I love you. But I love you and the living God who sees me lets me know that there is beauty for ashes for you are a beautiful black man. But what am I gonna do? I am by myself, I don't know how to do this and I don't think I can. How do I wrap my mind around being free when I've never experienced it before? I can't watch my child die, I can't help him, so don't push me, cause I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. I'm in the jungle and it makes me wonder how to keep from going under. This text says she put her son under a bush who was probably so sick from dehydration and exhaustion that he can't walk anymore. Then she walks away from him because she cannot bear the sight of his demise, and she wails. But she's free. She's free physically. Maybe God said how he said it and did what he did so that she could have justice, that she and her son would have their freedom. And sometimes freedom may not look like what you think or hope, but it is freedom. You have to be mentally free to be totally physically free. 
God set the captives free saying, you are human, you exist, and I see you. And then God does something so wonderful. He says something so comforting. The text says that God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of the Lord calls his mother's name. No longer slave, bondwoman, throwaway. He calls her name. And when you know somebody's name, they are no longer invisible or anonymous. It is an indication that you know them, you see them, and you know who they are. They are addressed particularly. So this is what the angel says, what ails you, Hagar? What's wrong? I am concerned about you, but also let me give you some words of comfort. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be concerned. Don't mourn. God has heard the voice, the cry of the boy, and get this, he heard him where he is. That's good news for somebody today. When his father and his mother forsook him, God heard his cry. He heard him in the wilderness. Oh, did I neglect to tell you that the boy, the Hagar's son's name, his name is Ishmael, meaning God hears. God hears my affliction. And if the Lord can hear Ishmael, who was left for dead under a bush, he hears us right here and right now. Even in the pit, even in the wilderness, even on the street, even in addiction, even in the space of craziness, even in our brokenness, he hears. And I'm so glad he hears me when I cry. I'm so glad I can cast my cares upon him because he cares for me. He has concern for me even in my mess that I made for myself, he hears me. I love the Lord. He heard my cry and pitied every groan. God is saying to her, you cried out to me in the wilderness before and I told you to go back into bondage in chapter 16, but now is your time. Now is your time to be free. Walk in it. You now have ownership of your body and can control the things you could not before. You are free. I heard you then and I hear you now. I hear you, I see you, and I will hold you. I will hold you in my loving arms. The Lord reveals the promise he made to Abraham concerning Ishmael. He shall be a great nation. Therefore, he shall live and not die. He will have descendants. You will have grandchildren, great grand, so forth and so on. There will be posterity for generations to come. God said, get up and open your eyes. I said, I'd make streams in the desert. See that well over there? Go and drink. Rejuvenate yourself and Ishmael. Go nurture your son and help him to regain his strength. Encourage him saying, you shall be a great nation. You shall live and not die, so hold on. You will have this in this. There will be generations to come. Hold him, comfort him, restore him. Hold him as I have held you and continue to hold you. Church, the Lord has called us to see, to hear, and to hold persons in need. The poor and the poor in spirit. Show them the love that God has shown you and the grace he continues to bestow upon you. Love them. Comfort them, restore them, hold them. You hold them knowing they are flesh and blood, that they have breath in them. You hold them knowing they are human and that they exist. You hold them and know their name. You hold them seeing and hearing them. You hold them until they can enflesh their freedom, until the impoverished, the marginalized, the former slave can get it and feel it and begin to walk in it. You hold them until they can see the well and drink from it to regain their strength. You hold them until they can see their salvation from the Lord. Otherwise, you've missed the message.